a certain extent. Um, and I'm going to use parts of it and not parts of it. It's really three or four PowerPoints together. I'm going to use most of the first section and just uh, run through a few other slides, which may be of interest as they go. That's the first point to make. Second point to make is I need to be apologetic and explain what am I, you know, I, I have a field that I, I get paid to do work for, for the university and geopolitics and borders. Um, I should really be speaking on the eve of the 1st of July about borders and annexation, which is a much more real topic uh, today. Um, well, how come I've got involved in looking into Anglo jury? Some of you may have heard me in the past few years at the Mood. I've spoken a lot about the David Hilburn windows, or you may have seen the synagogue site that I've been trying to push on Facebook, particularly synagogues in London and the UK, which have closed down. Those of you who don't know about it, go into Facebook and have a look. And if you have any interesting information or pictures or documents about all these beautiful old synagogues, which no longer exist in the UK, please add the information there. And also um, more recently and tonight about some of the uh, major Litvak or Lithuanian rabbis that came through England, spent periods of time there, uh, particularly in the first half of the 20th century. Although if we have a few minutes at the end, I'll show you that uh, uh, <coughs> It isn't limited to that period by no means what, what, whatsoever. You may be surprised to know, by the way, that uh, the Adar Haredit, the most orthodox religious Bet Din in Meir Sharim, outside the Torah Karta, the Adar Haredis, that sounds uh, more correct, is actually the head of it is a Rabbi Moshe Sternbuch, who you may have seen pictures of. And he's a North London, born and bred boy, speaks very fluent Cockney English, um, grew up in London, studied in Gateshead. Um, he speaks good English, good Yiddish. I don't know whether he speaks good Hebrew at all. Um, and uh, two other main Rabbanim in the Ada Haredit over the past 20 years, both with the surname of Weiss, not related to each other, um, both spent time in Manchester, both have British citizenship. And so you'd be surprised actually what an impact or, or, or what a major role uh, rabbis who have come through, um, Haredi rabbis who have come through Britain have played both in Britain itself and or in Israel at a later stage. Of course, when you say this to someone who's not from Britain, um, they say, oh no, there couldn't have been much going on in Britain. You know, the only places where the large ultra-Orthodox communities exist are Israel and the United States. And when I show them this PowerPoint, and I've got over 40 personalities on this PowerPoint today, and there are more coming, and some of them are very major players in the history of Haredi world over the past 100 years, they're very surprised at the individuals and at the number. Um, and remember, of course, that although today the United States has a phenomenally large Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox population, although, by the way, it's only 12% of American Jewry, but 12% of 6 million, like in Israel, is, uh, is, a, is a lot of people. <laughs> um, <coughs> although that has been a growth um, of the last 50, 60, 70 years from the 20s, 30s, post-World War II, when we go back to some of the period we're going to look at tonight, the late 19th and early 20th century, there were small religious ultra-Orthodox communities in Britain, much more than there were in the United States at the time. Um, and so a lot of the rabbis we're going to be looking at uh, came from Eastern Europe to Britain um, for all sorts of reasons. They were fleeing the pogroms, they were following their communities. Uh, Britain, of course, was that much closer to Europe than the many who went on the boats and the ships um, all the way across the ocean to the United, to United States. Many of them, by the way, stopping off in Britain. Um, some permanently, and some who remain permanently, as we know from the historical stories, not always realizing that's where they were, that that's where they were put off. Um, you may be interested to know that actually um, the Titanic in the steerage section, many of the dead people in the steerage section were Jews, mostly Orthodox Jews, but Jews generally, going from Europe to North America, who had changed boats in Southampton, and uh, there were some very big issues involved about uh, declaring them dead and agunot and so on, um, uh, et cetera. 
but a very significant number of Lithuanian rabbis came to Britain at the time. And um, what happened was that in the past few years, and I've been working in the archives um, in London, and I got to the LMA, the London Metropolitan Archives, to work on some historical research dealing with geopolitics and borders in the Middle East with my colleagues at King's College, I suddenly realized that the LMA is a depository of all the major Jewish archives of Britain. That means the United Synagogue, the Bet Din, the Board of Deputies, the Office of the Chief Rabbi, the Federation of Synagogues, and one or two others. Um, it's the main depository of Jewish archives in the UK. There are others, of course, and most notably the Park, James Parks archives in Southampton, which has some very important archives, including uh, Rabbi Vigda Schoenfeld and Diane Lazarus. And as I heard on your own talks just recently, somewhere I've got to get to, to the Cecil Roth archives in the University of Leeds. But nevertheless, the LMA has the main ones. Um, I um, asked, uh, you still have to receive special access to work on those archives at the LMA, LMA. Thanks to many people and contacts I have in Britain, not least um, uh, Charles Tucker, who is the archivist of the Jewish community, knows more about the Jewish community in his head than probably the whole of the Anglo-Jewish community together. Um, I got access to these archives and I said to myself, well, this is interesting. I'm also interested, and this is the other reason, in my own family history, which is part of this rabbinical history, and I make no apologies, they, some of them are going to figure quite prominently in what I'm going to say over the next half an hour. Um, so I said to myself, well, whenever I come to the LMA, I'll spend five or six hours working on the geopolitics archives, and then I'll just spend an hour or two at the end of the day having some fun in the Jewish archives. But of course, when you get to the situation where one is your bread and butter research for which you get paid, and the other is your hobby research, um, your hobby research becomes much more interesting. You become much more enthusiastic about it. And so there have been many days and even weeks when I've spent the five or six hours looking at the Jewish archives and just remembering at the end of the day to spend an hour or so looking at the, at the other archives. And I'm nowhere near finished. I want to tell you, both professional and amateur historians, I'm a great believer in the great famous historian A.J.P. Taylor's um, uh, argument that the historian is there to be enjoyed for the individual. It's not just for the academics and the professors. Um, for all those of you interested in your own family histories, your community histories, individuals, and so on, uh, you should go and delve into those archives, and you can actually look up the names of the files, if not the material itself, uh, on the internet today. There is some fascinating material there, and I find myself going from the office of the chief rabbi to the Beth Din, looking at the histories of communities of rabbis, and there's a, a, a lot of work to be done there. So all of those reasons put together, I became interested in the Hillman windows, the synagogues, the rabbis, the communities, and um, I'm, doing, I'm doing some serious work, but I'm having a lot of fun as well. And this is meant to be partially, you know, both a mixture of serious and fun. Um, and, I, and, I, and I hope that I can just raise some points which many of you pick up on. The other point I want to make is I know that this is a very diverse audience here. Um, because I've been selling it to a lot of my friends and colleagues as well. And I know there are people here who know a lot about the history of rabbis in the UK, and there are probably a lot of people who don't know, particularly not about the ultra-Orthodox rabbis. And I'll try and touch it at a point where there is uh, relevance to everyone who's listening, but I do apologize if maybe those who know the topic a bit better um, uh, don't find anything new. I think most of you will. The front page of the PowerPoint, as you can see, um, has a number of street signs from Israel and two Israeli postage stamps. Um, on the, on your, when we're looking at the screen, on the right is a stamp of Rabbi Isaac Halevi Herzog, who I'm going to talk quite a bit about tonight, who was, of course, the first chief rabbi of Israel after having been the chief rabbi of Dublin, Belfast and a few other places. I'm using the term Britain or United Kingdom in a very broad style because on the left is another rabbi who actually never lived in Britain but did get uh, married into some of these families, Rabbi Moshe Avigda Amiel, who became the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv after having been the rabbi in Antwerp for quite some time. 
And you can see all the other street signs, Rabbi Cook, Rabbi Herzog, Rabbi Unterman, uh, Rabbi Abramsky. These were all rabbis who passed through the UK, some for longer periods and some for lesser periods of time. Um, now we have to move on. Okay, oh, well, we went wrong there. So I particularly want to talk about four, six, seven personalities. Four of them you can see in this slide. Um, all of them were chief rabbis at one point or another in Israel. As I've already said, Moshe Avigda Amiel on the right is um, not really, he wasn't the chief rabbi of the whole of Israel, he was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. Um, and he, but he, like the others, had come from Lithuania. Most of the rabbis I'm talking about, not all of them, but most of them came from the real Litvish, Litvak heartlands of the areas of Vilna, Bialystok, Lomja. Um, there are people in this PowerPoint who aren't necessarily Litvaks um, and who may have come from further afield, but certainly the, uh, the ones we're talking about today, with maybe the possible exception of Diana Bramsky, um, were really from the heartland of Lithuania. So Amiel was one of, one of these people. But if you look from left to right, you see the first three chief rabbis of Israel, pre-state mandate Palestine. Yes, that's what everybody called it before there was a state of Israel. There were Jewish Palestinians and Arab Palestinians at the time. Um, the first chief rabbi appointed partly by the British mandate authorities was Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Cook. He was appointed as chief rabbi in 1921 and remained there until his death until 1935. And as I'll mention in a minute, probably had a great deal of contact um, with the British authorities, with Herbert Samuel, with the other governors. Um, but of course he spent a period of time in England during the First World War. For those of you who don't know about this, I'll make a few comments about it. He was followed by Chief Rabbi Isaac Halevi Herzog, who um, was originally the Chief Rabbi of Dublin. And um, he then was uh, elected in a, in a political contest in 1935 to replace Rabbi Cook. And I'm sure everybody is aware that he was the father of President Chaim Herzog um, and the grandfather of the present head of the Jewish agency, Buzi Isaac Herzog. Next to him is Rabbi Issa Yehuda Unterman, who became the chief rabbi after Rabbi Herzog died. There was an interregnum period of a few years, but Unterman became the chief rabbi, as you can see, in 1964. He spent over 20 years of his life as the rabbi of Liverpool. Um, when I say that to Israeli young people, they know Liverpool for one of two reasons, the Beatles or Liverpool football team. And when I say that the former chief rabbi, the one who was chief rabbi, who during the Six Day War was spent over 20 years as the head of the religious community in Liverpool, uh, they are quite surprised about it. So four very impressive, important figures in the religious world of the 20th century, all of them spending, well, Amiel in Antwerp um, and the others all spending time in Britain, England itself. Um, I just want to make a few comments about Rav Cook because he is um, not really typical of the people I'm going to speak about. Whereas the others all came from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, consciously, they moved there. They left Eastern Europe to go to a safer place. Uh, Rav Cook came to England by chance. Um, he had already, um, he was from Latvia originally. He had um, already left. He was a great, as you all know, religious Zionist. Today he's considered to be the mythical, um, philosophical head of the whole world of religious Zionism, although many would argue that uh, many of his writings have been misinterpreted, certainly at the political front. Nevertheless, he is considered to be the number one religious. And when in Israel you hear a young religious Zionist Jew saying, Harav, the Rav, and when there are many thousands of rabbis, they are referring to Rabbi Cook, to Rav Cook. Um, he already went to Palestine in 1902. He became the rabbi of Jaffa, of Jaffa, which was only just starting up. In 1914, he went on a visit to Europe. And when World War I broke out, he was in Switzerland and he couldn't get back to Palestine. He spent two years in St. Gallen and then the Machsike Adashul in the East End, who for quite some years had been looking for a suitable replacement for Rabbi Werner, um, uh, 
invited him to London to become their rabbi. Um, and he came and spent three years in London uh, as a very important figure, even Chief Rabbi Hertz, who was then just the beginning Chief Rabbi, and of course was Chief Rabbi for over 30 years, and he'll figure in a number of comments we make tonight, um, and, but who was a very strong-headed figure. Um, he understood the importance of Rav Cook and uh, didn't try to bear down on him too much. Uh, he involved Rav Cook in some of the discussions around the Balfour Declaration. I've seen a letter in the archives in the LMA, which show that, where, that the British government or whoever was um, issuing the letter about the Balfour Declaration sent a version to Chief Rabbi Hertz to ask for his comments. He sent it round to a few rabbis to ask for their comments. One of them was Rav Cook, um, who wasn't uh, sort of dependent upon him in the, in the way that other rabbis were. And you can see that there was even uh, that the Jewish establishment of the time, the Montagues uh, and so on, were very against political Zionism then and at a later stage, and they came out against the idea of Balfour Declaration. It was Ralph Cook that wrote a letter to many Jewish communities saying, no, this is a very important thing, we should support it, to the extent that in a debate in Parliament, uh, a member of Parliament by the name of Kylie said, as you can see, upon whom should we decide the religious aspect of this issue, upon Lord Montague or upon Rabbi Cook, the Rabbi of Masike Adas? So he had quite an influence on that. And after the Balfour Declaration was passed in 1917 at a celebrated banquet, he said, I've come not only to thank the British nation, but even more to congratulate it for the privilege of making this declaration. So he wasn't the person who influenced the fact that the Balfour Declaration was issued, but he did have a, a role in the uh, formation of the letter and in pushing it amongst the synagogue communities. Um, what's very interesting about Rav Cook, though, was he never wanted to be in London. He wanted to be home in Palestine, in Eretz Israel. And if you look at the letters to the left and his visiting card, you will see that for the three years that he was in London, he, was, uh, he had both in English and Hebrew, A.I. Cook, Chief Rabbi of Jaffa and the colonies of Palestine. Yes, that's the term they use. And then he writes in brackets, at present, Rabbi of the Machsiki Adas. Um, he always made it very clear that he was there temporarily um, and that the first moment that he could get back to Eretz Israel, he was going back, which is exactly what he did. World War I came to an end, and I don't know whether it was within weeks or months, he was on a boat <laughs> back to Palestine, um, and where he first of all was appointed to be the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and three years later to be the first chief rabbi of Eretz Israel which of course was not recognized by the ultra-Orthodox, headed by Rav Zonenfeld, who were very anti-Zionist. Although again, there's a lot of interesting material which shows that at the religious level, Rabbi Cook and Rabbi Zonenfeld um, actually got on okay. At the political level, they were very critical of each other, particularly Zonenfeld was critical of Cook. But if you look at the Jewish archives, um, the, the newspapers that used to exist in the 20s and 30s, many other newspapers, than the Jewish Chronicle. There was a paper called the Jewish Graphic, and every week they had an advert for Palwin wine, because before it relocated to London, it was originally in Palestine, and it carried the joint Kashrut authorization of Rabbis Cook and Zonenfeld for quite a long time. So the one time they were arguing very strongly about Zionism, but on the other hand, on religious matters, or on some religious matters, they had an agreement. It is said, whether it's a mythical story or not, that when Cook used to come um, uh, to Zonenfeld, Zonenfeld would get up in his honor and greet him, but only as the rabbi of Jaffa, not as the rabbi of Eretz Israel, because that was a political position. So he would only greet him um, in his uh, religious status. And if you look at the letter on the right, it's just one of many. It's a letter he writes when he's back. Um, in Palestine, he writes a letter to the Natsiv HaElyon, the High Governor, Mr. Her Sir Herbert Samuel. It goes without saying that if he was the Chief Rabbi from 1921 to his death in 1935, he was considered to be the leading religious authority by all of the successive British Mandate Governors. 
and there therefore must be a lot of correspondence between Cook and those governors. And there is a gentleman today, a Rav Zaev Neumann in Jerusalem, who is searching for every letter or every document Rabbi Cook ever produced. 30 years ago, they came out with three volumes of his letters. The second volume are all the letters when he was in London. Um, and they're now bringing out new volumes. They've already brought out three new volumes of his letters. And somehow he heard about my rummaging in the archives, and I go and search out letters for him. Some of them have appeared in the new volumes. And on March this year, I was about to come to England again, um, just in time to get to the Tottenham Stadium in time for Tottenham Manchester United, um, and then spend a week or two at the archives. Of course, everything closed down, and I haven't set foot in London since. But one of my objects was actually to look up the private archives of the successive governors after Herbert Samuel and to see what correspondence there is there with, uh, with Rabbi Cook, particularly in their private archives. But he obviously had, um, not only because he had been in England, that probably helped him get the position in 1921, but uh, he probably had a very strong association with the British governors at the time. Two other people that uh, we're going to be interested in are, I, I use for all of the people in the Palmer, I use a simple title of rabbi. Some are Dayan, some are this, and some are the other. I thought the best way that, uh, that uh, to do it was just to use the term rabbi for everybody in it, and no extra additions. Um, in addition to the four chief rabbis, of course, there are rabbis who were heads of the Beth Din in London. As you probably know, uh, London has four Orthodox Batei Din. I don't know if it did at that time. It may even have some smaller ones amongst the Hasidic groups, particularly around Stanford Hill today, like the Bells and the Vizhnitz and so on. Um, but the Beth Din, which has always been considered to be one of the leading Batei Din in the world, is the London Beth Din. Um, and um, I'm very... And, uh, um, it's had a number of very prominent members who have stood at its head. Um, two of the most prominent are part of this story. One is Rabbi Samuel or Shmuel Yitzhak Hillman, who you see to the left. He was, again, he comes from a very long line of eminent Rabbanim. Um, he came to Glasgow in the early 1900s. He spent six or seven years there putting together the Orthodox community in the Bet Din, and was then summoned or called to London to be the head of... No, I think the shouting will be the shouting woman. Hello? Okay. He was then called to London to be the head of the London Bet Din, where he spent 20 years, and in the early 1930s, he then went to live in Eretz Yisrael. He's a very important uh, person in this story because, as you will see, there's a lot of intermarriage going on here, incestuous marriage. Everybody is mar All these rabbis who came from Eastern Europe are marrying off their sons and daughters to each other. Um, my cousin, Rabbi Eliezer Simcha Weiss in uh, Petah Tikva, originally from Manchester, he, argued, he says that they all knew each other already in Lithuania and they even agreed that this would be the case when they came to England. I think that sounds a bit too much of a conspiracy theory, but nevertheless, there's no question that when they all came to different communities in the United Kingdom, they didn't trust their sons and daughters with the average regular English Jew. They thought they were too assimilated, too English. So in that generation, um, their children's generation, there was a lot of intermarriage of within and between these families, as we shall see. Um, Hillman was the Diane, the head of the Beth Din, until the early 30s. As soon as he reached what was considered at the time a suitable retirement age, he again went off to live in Palestine, in Eretz Israel, and they spent some time looking for a successor. The eventual successor was Rabbi Yechezkel Chatzko Abramsky. Although it took some years, he was already in London when Hillman retired. I know that because in the Yiddish newspapers, which report on my own great-grandfather, Rabbi Yaakov Rabinovitz's death, they both were there to give Hespadim, to give eulogies. But he wasn't immediately, uh, he had been rescued, in a sense, from Siberia. He'd continued to be an ultra-Orthodox rabbi after the Soviet, uh, rev after the Communist Revolution. He was eventually arrested by the Russian Soviet authorities, 
was originally sentenced to death, but there was a uh, uh, world pressure managed to get that uh, refuted. He was then sent in exile to Siberia, and a group of rabbis around the world, including Rabbi Cook, including Chief Rabbi Hertz and some others, put tremendous pressure through the British government on the Soviet authorities to allow him to leave, and he came to London. At first, he took over the Machsike Adas, and then Chief Rabbi Hertz was looking for a successor to Hillman, but he didn't want to offer the job to Yechezkel Abramsky, because Abramsky, as you can see, was a very ultra-Orthodox personality. Hertz liked to uh, rule the show. Hertz was strong-headed, Abramsky was strong-headed, Abramsky was quite severe in his rulings, quite stringent in his rulings, and Hertz looked around for someone who was more appropriate, as he thought, for the British Jewish community. The person he was soon put on, I've got a slide of him later here, but I'm not going to rush through to find it, was a very well-known rabbi who headed the Berlin Rabbinical um, Seminary, Rabbi Weinberger, Yechiel Weinberger, the author of a very famous book called Sride Eish. He was Rabbi Dr. Weinberger, which seemed to serve the purposes better. He was invited. Um, he uh, Hertz sent a delegation to meet and they met somewhere in Holland. Uh, Weinberger was offered the job, Yechiel Weinberger. Um, at first he said yes, and he went back to Berlin where he was the head of the Hildesheim Rabbinical Institute. His pupils persuaded him not to leave and he turned the job down and he stayed behind. The result of which was, by the way, he had a very tough Holocaust, uh, sent back to Warsaw in the ghetto, and then I think for a short while to Theresienstadt. And after the war, he ended up in the town of Montreux in Switzerland, where he wrote, he, there was a yeshiva there at the time, and he lived out his life there. The only time Weinberger ever came to Israel was actually when he died. It was one of the first mass funerals of ultra-Orthodox figures that ever took place um, in Israel. So after Weinberger turned him down, he turned a second time to Abramsky, and Abramsky accepted, and he became the head of the Beth Din from the mid-30s until he himself retired in the early 50s and also went to live in Israel, where he continued for some 20 years to be a very prominent Haredi figure. Um, he, he taught in the Slobodka Yeshiva in Bnei Brak. Um, <coughs> he eventually became the head of the Vard Yeshivot, of the, uh, the Committee of Yeshivot, of the whole of, of, of Israel. And he also received the Israel Prize for Religious Literature um, for his amazing work. Both Hillman and Abramsky have amazing uh, publications, long lines of work. Um, he received it for his, uh, what's called Chazon Yecheskel, his uh, commentaries on the Tosefta, and um, I'm not sure if today a Haredi rabbi of his stature would accept the Israel Prize, but he did at the time, and he was a very prominent figure. When I ask my friends in England today, I'm very friendly with Diane Binstock of the London Beth Din, who's been there for 20 years, and who's also very interested in Anglo-Jewish history, and particularly the history of the Beth Din. He says, look, there were some very prominent rabbis who were part of the Beth Din during the 20th century, but the only one who to this day, 50, 60 years later, his spirit hovers over the Beth Din to this day is Abramsky. And the reason why to this day, Orthodox religious Jews in England do not eat the hindquarters, unless they're imported today, of, uh, the, of, of the meat in England is because Abramsky, it was a condition on Abramsky's part to become the head of the Beth Din, that there would no, be no more porging, there would be no more use of the hindquarters, and that has lasted to this day amongst the shochtim, amongst the ritual slaughterers of England. So these six personalities were all very major. As I said, they made, they made good shiduchim. They married each other, and one of the first that we come up against is that the daughter of Diane Hillman married the son of Rabbi Joel Herzog, in other words, the Rabbi Herzog that we see here. Um, and it was like a royal wedding, although on a very small scale. And you can see from the Jewish Chronicle at the time, the wedding of Diane Hillman's only daughter, he was the head of the Beth Din, to Rabbi Dr. I. Herzog, who was then in Belfast, he hadn't yet gone to Dublin, was celebrated at Court Lodge. The chuppah was in the garden of Diane Hillman's residence. The parents of both rabbis, 
In other words, Dian Hillman himself and the father of Rabbi Herzog performed the ceremony. Rabbi Herzog's father was a very well-known rabbi who had come to Leeds in 1902, spent almost 10 years there, and in 1911 left to become the rabbi of Paris. Uh, this may have had something to do with the fact that Rabbi Deichis, Deichis came into Leeds, and uh, from what we can see in the documents, Rabbi Joel Herzog and Deichis didn't particularly get on with each other, and so Herzog went on Leeds. It meant that Rabbi Herzog, the chief rabbi, came as a very young man, less than 10 years old, to Leeds. He actually grew up as a kid in Leeds, and then he spent time between Paris and London. In London, he studied at university. Rabbi Herzog was self-taught, uh, but he went to university, wrote a PhD about the Tchelet, the blue uh, tzitzit, and um, he, so he was pretty English, as English as they come, although his background was from Lomja. And um, he then, as I say, accepted the position in Belfast, then was um, appointed in Dublin, and he wrote, excuse me for one page stealing from Wikipedia, but I love this sentence. Rabbi Herzog served as a rabbi of Belfast from 16 to 19, um, and was appointed rabbi of Dublin in 1919. Uh, fluent speaker of the Irish language. Uh, he was a supporter of the Irish War of Independence. He became known as the Sinn Féin rabbi. He went on to serve as chief rabbi of Ireland between 22 and 36, when he immigrated to Palestine because he was elected to succeed Rabbi Cook. And so he's became, and according to this book, he became a supporter of both the Irish Republican Army and the Irgun. But when he, the State of Israel came into being, in 1948, uh, he had already had a great deal of experience of a state coming into being because he'd been the chief rabbi of Ireland at the time of Irish independence. I had to throw this picture in because these are the descendants of that royal marriage. Um, and I'm going to say for two seconds, anyone who wants to unmute himself and tell me who that little boy, not little boy, in the white shirt at the front of the picture is, I'd be happy to hear what you think. If you know it, definitely don't answer. But anyone who wants to take a guess, anyone want to tell me who that boy is? Chaim Herzog. That's right, President <laughs> Herzog. That's right, Chaim Herzog. And to the right with another cap on his head is his brother, younger brother, Yaakov Herzog, who some of you may know was offered the position of Chief Rabbi in Britain after um, Chief Rabbi Brody in the mid 60s at the height of the Jacobs affair. Um, he at first, again, like Weinberger, he accepted. He then, six months later, turned it down. He said he was sick. No one believed him. Um, Isaac Wolfson was a big backer of his and of the Herzog and Hillman family generally. And at the back, the man standing at the back is Diane Hillman's son, David Hillman, who is responsible for half of the stained glass windows in most of the big London shawls, St. John's Wood, the Central, Boreham Wood, Hampstead Garden Suburb, Egerton Road. Uh, that is the David Hillman, as a younger man, of the stained glass windows fame. Um, Chief Rabbi Hertz didn't like the idea that uh, Rabbi Herzog was called Chief Hertz, was very uh, particular about him being the Chief Rabbi. And as you can see from the left, there was our attention has been called to a paragraph which appeared in the Jewish graphic concerning the visit of Mr. Sokolov, famous Zionist, to Dublin. In which Chief Rabbi Herzog, in which Rabbi Herzog described as the Chief Rabbi, the paragraph in question: We express our regret for this insertion. Our readers are well aware that we take particular care in always giving Dr. Herzog due recognition as the Chief Rabbi of all Jews in the British Empire. I have other letters which show that when my grandfather, Rabbi Yehuda Newman, was appointed to Rabbi of Notting Hill in 1921, the synagogue sent a letter to Chief Rabbi Herzog inviting him to be part of the installation ceremony. And at first his secretary wrote back saying, you should know that only, um, the, 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 uh, only the chief rabbi is known not as a chief rabbi, but as rabbi and everyone else as reverend. And he nearly didn't turn up because he was affronted by this. So he had uh, very strong opinions of what his uh, role and his position would be. Herzog <clears throat> was, um, Herzog and Hillman's, I say Herzog married Hillman's daughter. They were a pair together, both when he was in Ireland and Hillman was in London. And then when they went to Israel, Hillman was a very powerful figure in promoting the election of Herzog as chief rabbi to replace 
Rabbi Cook. There was a lot of politics involved, as you can imagine, then as now. And Diane Hillman was very involved in that. And you can see that just before Herzog left to go and take up the position in Palestine, uh, these are posters, which I'm very grateful. Some of you may know uh, Professor David Latchman, the head of Birkbeck College, who has a very interesting private collection of documents and materials relating to the history of Anglo Jewry. And I took a picture of these posters when I visited his collection in his house in Golders Green. And it shows Rabbi Herzog coming on his way to Israel to give some major lectures and talks um, in London on his way. So Herzog may have been in Ireland, but he was very much part of the UK rabbinical setup. He came to London a lot and so on. Uh, two years ago, a book uh, originally in Hebrew was translated into English, The Rabbinate in Stormy Days. Uh, there was um, an inauguration of the book put on by his grandson, Bougie Herzog, which took place no less than in the garden of the house of the Irish ambassador to the state of Israel. And on the right, you see him as chief rabbi already shaking the hands of President Chaim Weizmann, Chaim Weizmann. The, first, the first president, first president. with Moshe Charette at the back. Um, and although Weizmann is always thought of as being the one who came through England, I would have thought that probably Rabbi Herzog had a much more fluent English uh, elocution than Weizmann himself, but they both came through the UK. And the UK was, it may not be very significant today, excuse me, my British friends, but it may not be very significant today in what goes on in Israel or in Palestine. But at that time, it was a very important place because of the mandate. And this was a later picture of Herzog and, uh, and Weizmann. He left a legacy behind him, of course, Herzog, um, his writings, the prayer that we say in Israel and many British schools as well today for the state of Israel was composed partially by Rabbi Herzog. And the settlement that you may know in Gush Etzion, originally in Gush Etzion, which was destroyed by the Jordanian legions in the War of Independence and then was reset in Shafir, Masawat Yitzchak was actually named after Isaac Halevi Herzog when he was still alive. And this is the, um, uh, the uh, monument or the, the plaque which was put up by his son, the president, uh, many years later in 19. One thing I should say about Herzog is that um, many of you remember that when Chaim Herzog, before he became president, was the ambassador to the United Nations, he got up and, um, and tore the Zionism is racism paper into two. Um, and uh, this was a big issue, of course. People are less aware that actually he copied what his father did in 1939-40 when, when he got up at a big meeting and tore up the British white paper of MacDonald, which then limited Jewish immigration to Palestine. And he actually, he was copying his father, who had done the same thing nearly 40 years previously. Hillman also left a legacy in his beautiful stained glass windows. Uh, there is one amongst the over 100 windows in St. John's Wood Shul. When I'm in London, I often go there and I patrol the windows and I've got photos of them and give talks about them. There's one small window in the ladies' gallery. And as you can see at the bottom, it's written, Lezecha Avi Rabbi Mori Hagaon Shmuel Yitzhak Hillman, um, Ravad London. He had one in the name of his father, uh, the Diane Hillman. And I needed to fill up this page with one other window of his. And the reason I looked at the one to the right, because this is one that interests me a great deal. In Orthodox synagogues, you don't have full face fronts of people. It's like having a pestle, um, which of course is considered to be against one of the Ten Commandments. One of his very last windows in his whole life, this was done in the late 60s, or early 70s, has this Purim window with two full frontal faces. So number one, it's intriguing. And number two, the reason I put it there, because his family say that the reason he did it was that he got permission from his brother-in-law, the chief rabbi Herzog, to do this. So that's where Herzog comes into the picture as well. No one is able to know whether that's the case or not the case. We then move on, actually, here I'm going to indulge five minutes in some family history to the Rabinowitz family. What's very interesting is that um, you had Herzog ending up all over Ireland. You had Hillman in Glasgow. Um, and here is a family called Rabinowitz um, who came to Edinburgh. The second person here, my great grandfather, who started off as the rabbi in Edinburgh and then also in the middle of the First World War, 
uh, at the same time that Rabbi Cook came to London, also came to London, and ended up being the rabbi of the Montague Road Base of Medrash in Dalston until his passing in 1932. And there is one of his sons, quite a well-known character. He was the chief rabbi in South Africa and later the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. And I threw in another rabbi who just by chance happens to have been my grandfather, but he was also one of this extended family. Um, Jacob Rabinowitz um, was considered to be a great scholar. Um, and like the Herzogs and the Hillmans and the others we've mentioned so far, they were what you would say today, they were great Zionists. Now, the concept of being a Zionist and being a Haredi back in those times um, was rather different to the way we discuss it today. I saw recently um, that Jeff Maynard put on his side of books that the fact that there was a Rabbi Litwin in the pre and post war period in England who was in charge of the Haredi section of the British Zionist Federation. And when I asked Jeff, what did he mean by that? He said it was what the Mizrahi called the religious part of the British Zionist Federation. Yes, there were many rabbis like Zonenfeld who were opposed to Zionism, but there were many ultra, ultra Orthodox rabbis who were great proponents of Zionism. And Rabinowitz and Herzog and Hillman were all in that category. Um, Rabinowitz in particular was quite, uh, as they say in Hebrew, harif, very sharp about this uh, thing. Um, he made very good shidduchim. One of them was with Newman, and I'll pass this very quickly. Just look at the dates, though. In January 1921, Newman was appointed to, but to be the head of the Notting Hill Shul. In the same month he was installed, he obviously didn't have a wife yet, which was obviously not very acceptable. Um, and so in February 1921, he got engaged. In March 1921, he got married, and he was a rabbi, grew a beard, and was acceptable that Notting Hill was a federation shul. His smicha was actually one of the three given by Rabbi Cook, as you can see there, when he was in London. He made another good shidduch because he married into the Hillmans. So another of his daughters married the stained glass window designer, David Hillman. So that was a second very good marriage he made within the rabbinical authorities. I love these old wedding pictures where you see the combination of Haredi rabbis with their long beards, but with their top hats. Um, there's a lovely description of what the bride and all the maids wore, the lace and the taffeta and the flowers, and a very lovely combination of what it was like to be a Haredi rabbi, but wanting to be part, not wanting to be cut off from the community, as many of the Haredi communities, particularly the Hasidic communities, do today. And he made a third good shidduch when another of his sons, Louis Rabinowitz, married the daughter of the Rabbi Amiel, who we've also already discussed, who became the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. So he, you know, this is what you call the, um, uh, the, as you say, you could say it's incestuous. You could say it's very good dynastic heritage. Within the Haredi world, I'm sure that makes for very good yichus or very good shidduchim. Um, what did it mean to be a Zionist in those days? And here I found some letters of Newman in his early days in Notting Hill. It was a shul of Eastern European poor people, um, and every Yom Kippur, he put together the Kol Nidre appeal, you would call it, and he sends the money to Rabbi Zonenfeld in Palestine. One year, he sends the whole of one pound, one litre. A few years later, he sends one pound fifty, and he asks for Zonenfeld to divide it equally between different charities in Jerusalem, to the old people's home, to the Yeshivat Eitz Chaim, and to the Bet uh, HaYetomim, the orphan's house, of Rabbi Diskin, who didn't come through England, but was also part of this Litvak wider family. So they were very, so they, it was very important for them to give money to Eretz Israel. They were the sort of amounts, it sounds nothing, um, even when you take into account inflation, but actually it was a lot more than you think. I can't remember. I did look into what it was worth at the time, but it was very important for them to raise money at the time for Eretz Israel. When Rabinowitz died, it was all over the Yiddish press. And there are long lists there um, of uh, Hillman and, and, uh, and um, Abramsky all giving the various obituaries at the time and thousands of people. And he is the only one of this whole group who didn't make it to the land of Israel. He died in London in 1932. Um, unexpectedly, he hadn't been sick. I think uh, he had indigestion or something um, at the time. Uh, and he's buried in the Edmonton Federation Cemetery those of you whose history 
uh, takes an interest in cemeteries. I personally think that the two most interesting Jewish cemeteries in London, Orthodox cemeteries, one of course is Willesden because of uh, the, all of the Rothschild people, the chief rabbis and the various <laughs> other luminaries buried there and probably the Edmonton Federation Cemetery. There's some very important rabbis buried there, including the Telzerov who had been visiting England in the early part of the 20th century to raise money and had a heart attack and died when he was there. Um, and uh, Rav Dessler's father and many of the other rabbis of the community at the time. And um, right at this very moment, actually, our family are renovating his gravestone and other gravestones. But of course, it's all been put to a stop because of, uh, um, of Corona. But long um, eulogies and uh, descriptions in the Yiddish papers, there were two or even three daily Yiddish newspapers in the 1920s and 30s, two of them religious papers, one a secular cultural Yiddish paper. This is from obviously the Yiddish papers and it obviously goes a long way to describing the connections and the heritage and the yichos, because that's what counts in that sort of, uh, in that sort of world. Um, and he wrote two books, Rabinowitz, and that's his gravestone in the Edmonton Cemetery today. Um, those of you who know your Tanakh, your Chumash, um, he died in the week of Parashat Vayishlach, and his name was Jacob, Yaakov. So they take an appropriate puzzle from that week's Parashat Yaakov, Halach Ladarko, Vayifgeu Bo Malachei Elohim. And that is what is written. Um, I, I, I shouldn't really say this, but on the first occasions I, took, I came to England, I took my kids to see Tottenham play at White Hart Lane. We first of all visited the cemetery and then visited the football ground. And I used to joke with them that we've been to two parts of uh, sacred territory in North London today. Uh, and their legacies of Sifrei Torah, which we've brought to Israel from their past communities, and which have now been repaired and used by young communities in Israel in the name of these various uh, rabbis. But it wasn't all rosy. Rabinowitz, Abramsky, Hillman, these ultra-Orthodox rabbis, all within one or two generations, had children who married out. Rabinowitz had six daughters. Three of them in the 1930s became GPs. Now I find that remarkable. Um, even in a regular family, it would have been remarkable, let alone in an ultra-Orthodox family. Um, three of them became GPs. Um, and uh, <laughs> one of them actually, uh, Fanny Rabinowitz went to Israel very early in the 50s, set up the nurses um, a unit at uh, the nurses training school. Now that's a hospital. And, but look, you know, so you know Dame Jenny Abramsky, she was a granddaughter of, um, of Diane Abramsky. Her father, Professor Shimon Abramsky, was a great professor of Jewish studies, but moved away from orthodox practices. And my good friend, Rabbi Pini Dunner, who is also very interested in these topics, tell me that he was at Shimon Abramsky's funeral at the Hoop Lane Cemetery, um, the Reform Cemetery, when they were going to cremate him, and he and some people came in and virtually hijacked the body of Shimon Abramsky and took it over the road and gave it a proper burial out of respect for the father, Diana Abramsky. Um, uh, Pinny, who is very engaged in Jewish history, is interested in many similar topics, is a good candidate to give a talk about some of these people and individuals. But it is interesting how these ultra-Orthodox rabbis, they Education was very important. Their children became doctors and professors and dames, and many of them moved away from religion in a very short time. Of course, many remained very much in religion and remained very orthodox. We can't go through all this. You go, I'm going to run through, but you can see there are many other people we could talk about. That's Rabbi Herzog's father. Leeds at the beginning of the 20th century was considered to be the orthodox community outside London long before it transferred to Manchester. There were in the provinces many people. And here is another very important person in our story. Well, Rabbi Elia Lopium, which we won't talk about, that's a whole story in time, but Rabbi Desla, who came in the 30s, um, Hillman took to him, found him, he, he took over the Montague Road base of Medrash for a short while, decided it wasn't for him to be a rabbi of a synagogue. And he eventually, as many of you probably know, was called upon he went and set up the Kolel in Gateshead and became a very important figure in the Gateshead world. 
but actually he, for many years in London, was the private tutor, thanks to Hillman, of Rabbi Sassoon, the person who became Rabbi Sassoon, the most prominent Sephardi rabbi in the UK of the uh, 20th century, and was once even thought of as being a possible candidate for the Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel. Um, Dessler was a very important character, although you wouldn't have called him a Zionist in the same sense as the others. He nevertheless, after the war years in Letchworth and Gateshead and setting up Gateshead, was called upon to be the Mashkiach of Ponovich Yeshiva, where he spent the last years of his life in, in Bnei Brak. Um, Dessler, in a book that came out 20 years ago, Natan Chochma Lishloma, which was a book in honor of Solomon David Sasson, um, they reproduce a letter that Dessler wrote to Hillman, must have been the late 40s, because Hillman was in Israel, Dessler obviously wrote it from England, um, and he obviously was very grateful to Hilbert to his dying day. And the interesting thing is, although he was part of the Gateshead world, he writes at the very end of the letter, um, Hillman's son-in-law, he calls him the miracle of the generation, the great Gaon, the great scholar, who was, of course, Rabbi Isaac Halevi Herzog, the chief rabbi, of the State of Israel and a very strong Zionist. So again, you see the difference in the relationships between those who opposed and those who promoted Zionism, even within the ultra Orthodox community. This is a whole nother lecture. They gave birth to a whole different trend of Lithuanian rabbis in England, the Gateshead crew, the, uh, the Gurovitzes, the Lopians. I don't have time to go into all of these people. And they had different Roshay Yeshivot, one, was uh, Rabbi Zahn, who was in Sunderland, Yudhazev Segel, who was the Rosh Hashiva Manchester. He was actually born in London. The gentleman to the left, Rabbi Moshe Schneider, who was born in Germany, was the head of a small yeshiva in London, but many of the leading Orthodox scholars who became Orthodox scholars in Gateshead or even Sternbuch in Israel afterwards were his pupils. And although he's probably not very well known outside the Haredi community, he was considered to be a very major influence on the growth. You had more educated people who came from Germany, the Dayanim, Chief Rabbi Jakobowitz's father, um, Dayan Grunfeld, more recently Rabbi Chanor Herentro, who came from Germany, was head of the Beth Din, many other Batei Din, Rabbi Michael uh, Fisher, who is also buried in Edmonton, very interesting crew. And here we have our Rabbi Yechiel Weinberg, the person who turned down the chance to be the head of the Beth Din, as I say, then had a very tough Holocaust. I should have written Rabbi Dr. Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, because that's what Hertz liked about him in the same way that when they were promoting Rabbi Herzog to be chief rabbi of the land of Israel, it was suggested to him by some of the Haredi population that he drop his doctor title to make it more acceptable to many of his potential Haredi voters. He decided to keep it. Um, other prominent rabbis, I simply don't have time to go through them. These are the three I mentioned at the beginning who are now... Uh, two of them are now basically running the Eid of Haredis in Jerusalem today. One is already passed. Sternbuch, as I say, was born in London, grew up in England, studied uh, with uh, Rabbi Rakov in Gateshead, Kolel, and the others came through Manchester, and so on and so on. We have the Schoenfelds, we have the chief rabbis. I just want to make two more points, and I realize I've well overrun my time. I'm going to stop. You did have people who didn't quite become chief rabbis but they were nevertheless from Litvisha stock to a certain extent. You had Rabbi Dr. Yaakov Herzog, the brother of President Herzog, who was offered the position and then turned it down because he was ill. People didn't believe him. As you know, he died very young. You had Rabbi Dr. Koppel Rosen, who was considered a future candidate. Um, and he also left the rabbinate, set up Carmel College, and also died fairly young. And of course, you have Rabbi Dr. Professor Louis Jacobs, who was considered by in, an, in a poll at the end of the century to be the most single significant figure in Anglo jury of the 20th century. I probably don't need to tell anyone about the whole history of the Jacobs affair, but I want to end this by tying a few things in together. Jacobs at the beginning of his life was a student at the gates of Kolel and was considered to be a very important personality. You have a lovely picture in the late 40s, early 50s, of him on a platform in Manchester with Diana Bramsky. Um, and you have a letter from the Henri Ewan Montague, much later, after the Jacobs Affair, 
saying he'd been to Israel, he'd visited Diana Bramsky, and um, Diana Bramsky had said, this was in 1963, he discussed the Rabbi Louis Jacobs Jews College problem, as it was known at the time, and Diana Bramsky, according to Montague, sighed and said, if only I had still been there, he'd never have come to this, while Pinny Dunner tells me he has seen a letter um, which says that when Rav Dessler left England, by the way, in the Jacob's biography, autobiography, it, uh, he shows that Dessler came from Israel to England, especially to be at his wedding. And Dunner tells me that uh, he's seen a letter where Dessler, when he was weighing up whether to leave England or stay there, he said, I'm sure that there are going to be Gedolim, great scholars in the future of England, and he mentioned Louis Jacobs as one of these people. So it shows what an interesting world we live in, and we could go on further and further. We don't have time. Um, and I have some pictures at the end of the Orthodox rabbinate as it has changed over time from dogs' collars and hats to religious authorities. You can see in the, one of the above pictures, uh, Louis Jacobs there. You can see the present chief rabbi. And if I had time, I'd talk about these amazing pictures. I'm sure many of you may know people from here, an early 50s picture of which there are many rabbis <clears throat> of the Orthodox world at the time. I could go on and on and on. I think I've used up my time. I hope you've enjoyed it. As I say, it hasn't been a hard academic lecture. It's been looking at personalities, looking at their role, and I'm very happy to receive comments. As I say, it's a work in progress, which will probably never finish. Thank you very much. Mind a few questions now. As many uh, as you want, as soon as I get out of. Yeah. Let me just find how I get it back into. Um, uh, how do I see some people here? Uh, you press the uh, speaker view and then you go on to gallery. Where is the speaker? At the top. You hover the cursor at the top, top right hand corner of the screen. It should say speaker view. Yes, I know. Oh, maybe here. It and then it's either gallery view or speaker view. Um, you want gallery view. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, You've got okay, a let's, let's, I've got a few of you here. I haven't got the whole gallery. I've yet. got Dr. Carol. Uh, yes. Okay, would anyone like to unmute themselves and ask a question? David, this is Jack here, uh, Jack Wexler. Uh, I just want to thank you. That was absolutely fantastic speech. Talk. Thank you, Jack. I Thank really you. enjoyed we're, it. Thank we're you. Gonna be in the, you we're going to be in the Galil this weekend, not far from you. Okay. <laughs> You're always welcome. Anyone else, please? Oh, that's yeah. all you've got to say. I thought you were going to ask a question. You, no, you, you, now, what's to ask you? Um, uh, you would uh, have known uh, some of these other characters that yes, I went I, through. I noticed through. you had a picture there of, uh, uh, of uh, Rabbi, uh, uh, what's his name, Tzvi Dunna. Um, who no. was in the Alas of Troy when I was a kid. Of Joseph uh, Hirsch, the, 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 the father of the dynasty, yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, um, he actually came from Germany, though. Yeah, there are a few people. I mean, I, I, as I've developed this thing, so it's gone on, of course, uh, there were many who came in later stages from Germany, whether they be Grunsfeld or Ehrentrau or Dunner. And, of course, Dunner's uh, players to this day in the Haredi community in yeah. England. Yes. Um, let, let's say they're not exactly Litvaks, but they're but they're not part of the Hasidic community. Yeah. So Angela Lehrer asked if you could say a couple of words about Rabbi Schoenfeld, please. That's a whole lecture on its own, um, and there have been two or three books written about uh, Rabbi Dr. Schoenfeld. Um, as you saw, I had a picture both of him and his father. He's the only one I had two pictures of. In this PowerPoint, let's see if I can get back there as I'm still on, as I'm still on um, share. Um, and the reason is because of his famous escapades in the immediate post-war era, when he donned the British Army uniform. He'd never served in the British Army, and he, like Chief Rabbi Herzog, and like quite a few other rabbis, went round searching for Jewish children in monasteries and other places hidden away. Um, he brought many children to England, as you well know. He was responsible for Rabbi Dunno, who Jack just mentioned, coming there. He was responsible for the Jacobovitzes coming to England. He was responsible for many people coming to England. 
he was different in one respect to many of the other kinder transport, and that was he was not prepared to have any of the children he brought over go to non-Jewish homes. As you know, almost half of the kinder transport, because there weren't enough people to take them, um, had to go to non-Jewish homes. Some came back into the community afterwards, some didn't. Um, but Schoenfeld wasn't prepared to let that happen. He insisted that they all go to Jewish homes and preferably religious Jewish homes. Um, and he built up the whole um, Torah of uh, Vaudar school. It, 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 when I went to the Evigda Primary School, as my friend Jack also did, who just uh, made a comment, in the 1960s, many of the kids uh, in what was a Schoenfeld school were children of um, German uh, people who either survived the Holocaust or had got out before the war and had come to England at the time. And of course, Rabbi Dr. Schoenfeld, who, by the way, was the son-in-law of Chief Rabbi Hertz, um, which is why he got a lot of support. Again, two very strong-headed characters. Probably that was the only way they could get on with each other by being married into the same farm family. He was a bit of a maverick, but he set up the Jewish Orthodox movement. His father, who you see here, Rabbi Wigde Schoenfeld, had come originally to England from Germany. What many people don't know is he had left England and then gone to try and settle in Palestine found it very difficult and after two, three years, came back to London and was the first head of the Adas Yisrael, which originally set up in Newington Green Road, then in Green Lanes, then in Queen Elizabeth Walk next to the Evigda School. And today the main Adas Shul is in South Tottenham, not far from Egerton Road. And the rabbi there is Diane Dunner, the son of Rabbi Dunner. But Schoenfeld was an amazing character in his own right, probably not always recognized for it during his life, but today now we know more and more about what he did and he rescued and brought to England literally hundreds, if not thousands of Jewish kids. A couple more, couple more questions and then I think we need to wrap up. Can I, can I jump in? Oh, I'm, I'm afraid about this one. He knows more about this than I do. <laughs> um, first of all, it's magnificent. Secondly, can you please do another lecture starting about halfway through the PowerPoints. Yeah. Um, thirdly, um, two points. In that report <clears throat> of, the, um, of the Herzog wedding, it said that a Mr. Weitzman of Manchester... I saw that. I don't think it was Chaim Weitzman. I don't think so, but I don't know. So. I don't... Uh, I don't think so, but I don't know. I also had the same feeling, yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is, I had, a, I had an idea that Rav Cook had gone from Switzerland to Finland as chief rabbi of Helsinki. No, there was someone else who came through Helsinki. It wasn't Cook, um, but there was someone who came through Helsinki for a year. Uh, it's funny, it rings a bell, and it is one of these people, but it wasn't Rav Cook. Um, we'll have to look it up together and find out who it was. Thank you. We're getting some extraneous noise now, so whoever that is, if they could mute themselves. Uh, anyway, Elkin Levy is who just made the comment, former president of the United Synagogue, yes. lives in Netanya. He is the person who can identify about half of the people in this picture. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Elkin, can, can, can I, I, we would like to identify this picture. It's been on the query on Facebook. So I can see a minister from Cardiff there, but if you can. I didn't mention, of course, Rabbi Rogoznitsky in Cardiff, another yeah, yeah. one who could join exactly. the group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, I think we, we've held Cat David captive now for an hour and getting on for 10 minutes. So, um, and it's getting late in Israel, isn't it? It's 20 to 11 now. Okay. But if we're going to finish, I want to end with an anecdote. Yes. Go on. I indulged myself in family stories. So I want to tell a family story. You know how stories become myths and you never know if they're true or not. The reason that Rabbi Jacob Rabinowitz left Edinburgh towards the end of the First World War to come to London was because, as you can imagine, as many rabbis do, they fell out with their communities. <laughs> and he called them um, and they asked Chief Rabbi Hertz to intervene. And Chief Rabbi Hertz 
sent Rabbi Hillman, who Rabinowitz and Hillman knew each other from Edinburgh and Glasgow, and then afterwards they married their children to each other, and he was then the head of the Beth. And he sent him to adjudicate. They came to some sort of agreement that Rabinowitz would uh, receive a sum of money, would no longer engage in Kashrut, which was, of course, the big issue, as it always is, and would eventually leave. Um, Rabinowitz also opposed the idea of Edinburgh becoming a single community. He was head of the Yiddish community. As soon as he left, Rabbi Deichis came there and united, unified the whole community. And just as Herzog and Deichis, the father, never got on in Leeds, so Rabinowitz and Deichis, the son, never got on in Edinburgh. Great, good, typical rabbinical histories. However, one of the arguments made against Rabinowitz was that in order to uh, get a decent income, he wasn't paid very much by the shul, he got involved in property geschäft. He owned a few flats here and there, a few buildings, and he rented them out. And in one of the buildings he rented out in Edinburgh, um, a family came in and opened up a tray for butcher. It wasn't anything to do with the Jewish community. There wasn't any issue here of meat being sold to the Jewish community. It just so happened that the woman who took over the place, opened up a butcher. And since Rabinowitz was head of the Kashrus Authority in Edinburgh, his um, community felt that this was improper, and they made a big issue with Hertz and wanted him to close it down or to sell the shop. And there were many letters between the two. By the way, I found in the archive 17 original letters in Rabinowitz's handwriting between him and Hertz from 1915 and 1916. Eventually, Rabinowitz left and came to London. And the mythical... We've got too much competition, I'm afraid. No, I'm just going to finish. And the mythical story is that when he left Edinburgh, he turned round and he said, I never had any dealings with Chaza, the kid, in Edinburgh, but I had a lot of dealings with Chazairi. <laughs> Uh, that's the mythical story we carry in the family. Okay, thank you very much for being here tonight. I hope thank you. you enjoyed it. Uh, that, was a, that was a tour de force, David, for which we're all very grateful. Um, my knowledge has gone from zero to expertise. Well, I'd like to think so anyway. Um, but we would really like to invite you back again on, on your main profession of, of being a professor of geopolitics, because... We desperately need some clarification as to what's going on in Israel today. Is it annexation? Is it assertion of sovereignty? Is it re uh, reunification? Or is it uh, extension of civil law? So we could probably have an, a lecture on that, on those four different definitions. If, if, if the government Hello. doesn't know, how should I know? <laughs> Well, we would really like to have you back whenever you're prepared to come back. So a, a very big thank you from all of us. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, okay, goodbye, everybody. I might just stick around to say goodbye to David and uh, Caroline, um, if she's still with us. So I'll, I'll, I'll stay around for a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's interesting. I think it was Rabbi Werner who was in Helsinki. Yes, it could be, could be. Um, I think he may have gone through there for a year. Okay, Richard, are you still there? Yes. Okay, I'm going to sign out. And okay, thanks, but we're, I would really like you to come back again, obviously, at a time of your choosing. Well, when I'm doing it like this from home in an evening, it's no real big... Uh, no big yeah. issue. Please do let me have a link to the uh, recorded version. So, okay. Yes, we will do. We will do. Anyway, uh, Lila told to you and to